Season 12 is officially upon us. Or at least the preseason is. Preseason is a confusing time where many different things in this game become ridiculously OP. Sometimes champions will instantly become stronger, seemingly with no warning and out of nowhere. Other champions might suffer due to an indirect change that had nothing to do with them. For example, Rengar was quite nerfed on the Chemtech map as it removes a lot of bushes. You might call this an oversight, I might call it a fail, your friend might call this a mistake, and Riot might call it an intended feature. But either way, some champions win during preseason and others lose. Thankfully for Rengar, he will be receiving a buff to actually allow him to jump in the chem fog. These massive game system changes typically require tons of band-aid fixes like this, and it will not be the last time we see this in Season 12. Besides the fact that the preseason is the most unbalanced state the game ever reaches, it can still be good fun. Think about it, every time there's a bunch of changes, it opens up many new doors to possible builds, runes, even roles for certain champions. Today, I'm here to give you some thoughts so far and help you have some fun in the preseason. To do that, I conducted a very simple, yet mentally taxing experiment. I decided to play this new season until I was on the verge of uninstalling. You see, I finished Diamond 2 in Season 11 where my top 4 champions were Cassiopeia, Yasuo, Swain, and Senna. The first day that preseason came out, some people were saying that Cassidy was quite strong, so I decided to try it myself. Turns out, pretty freaking good. After being just a single win away from Diamond 1, something tragic happened. My personal biggest losing streak of all time. I dropped 14 games in a row from the Diamond 1 promo game back to Diamond 4. And some of these were just horrific. I am glad for your sake that I endured this so you don't have to, because this preseason has easily been the most toxic, rage-inducing period of solo queue I have ever experienced in all of my many thousands upon thousands of hours of playing this game. The amount of genuine inters, people, AFKing, soft inting, and rage splitting, I'm serious when I say I feel like the preseason has been PBE level quality of games. It really took a toll on my mental health, but in light of a bad situation, I feel figured we could try to make some good fun out of it. I decided to sacrifice a bit of my elo to try some new things. I wasn't totally concerned with using stuff that was already proven. That doesn't mean that I trolled per se, but I was willing to give quite literally anything that came to mind a decent chance. AP Kaisa mid with first strike? Heck yeah, let's try it. I played over 150 ranked games and about 120 normal games so far trying out as many different things as I possibly could. It wasn't just about what I played, but also what my enemies and teammates were playing in other roles and having success with. I've been taking notes on every single game during this preseason, watching VODs of streamers and pro players, checking win rates religiously, and fully investing myself into Season 12, for better or for worse. So I'm here today to share what I've learned in over 250 games that I've played in less than one month. Now if I sat here and I told you that Victor is strong and we went on a 20 minute ramble session about why he's good, that wouldn't really be a good video. I mean, maybe you would agree with it, but that doesn't necessarily make it entertaining. You know that he's good, and you've probably either been spamming or banning it in the preseason. But before we get into the most interesting parts, let's talk about some of the obvious OPs. The god tier champions, if you will, that you should probably be playing right now if you want to gain elo for the rest of this, as well as the beginning of the new season. What more can someone say about Cassidy? Two new items, Crown of the Shattered Queen and Fimblewinter, have turned a champion who was already good last year into now the most OP mid laner. If you are really snowballing, you can go for a heavy damage build with Shadow Flame and Ludens. And even after this Cosmic Drive nerf, Cassidy is still able to get a mini phase rush to allow him to kite around in a fight. We've already seen the first Cassidy nerf of the season on 1124B, where he was directly hit in hopes to bring him down a bit. But given the fact that most of the item changes were beneficial for him, it's unlikely that this will cause him to go anywhere. He is, in my opinion, the best mid laner in the game at the moment, and he's pretty much free low. 
From one carry role to another, Vayne has become now the strongest AD carry in the game due to being the best lethal tempo user in the game. And although it was nerfed to lose the 25 bonus range on ranged champions, it also saw the attack speed bonus increased. There's a good reason why she has an insane pick rate, an insane win rate, as well as ban rate. She was also nerfed on the micro patch along with Cassidy, but it's just for the bonus AD on her ultimate. It's not that this is an insignificant nerf, but it's not also the reason that Vayne is really strong. I expect this to not matter very much, and we will be seeing lots more Vayne until she receives some really strong nerfs. Tank supports with the Glacial and Even Shroud combo. Both of these things were already nerfed once after the first patch cycle, but it's still very good. Let's say hypothetically, just for the sake of argument, that Nautilus or Leona hits one piece of CC on you. You're dead. Pretty much every single time, if Nautilus lands Q or Leona lands E, there's not much you can do about it after that. Sure, they're not as tanky as they are with the Aftershock setup, but the amount of extra kills generated is most of the time worth that trade-off. Even if the tank dies in the fight, if it means that the ADC gets two kills instead of just one because of all the damage and the AoE slow, that's definitely worth it. The top lane has a few premier tanks at the moment that were all good last year, but now with Frostfire are even better. Tom Kench, Dr. Mundo, and Shen. What's the counter to these three beefball tanks? Well, it's pretty simple. You can try Trundle with Divine Sunder. Trundle top should be picked at least three or four times as often as it is right now. He is impossible to deal with if he gets ahead because he'll never be stopped in the side lane. Mundo was already nerfed on the micro patch and it should bring him down a notch below Kench and Shen. In the jungle, the most successful ones that I've seen nearly every single game that they are in are still Vi and Nunu. They were very good last year and that is going to continue into this preseason and early 2022. Their gank machine playstyle is perfect in the chaos of a brand new season where so many people are trying new things and with so many squishy assassins running around as well, Vi just murders them. If you play Enchanter supports, Sona and Soraka are the best in the game at the moment with Lulu, Nami, and Yumi not too far behind. Graves is just Graves. I'm sure you've seen about enough of him at this point. He's good in jungle as well as the solo lanes, even after the nerf to his lifesteal and crit interaction last season. He's been good for a while now and will most likely need some more nerfs if he's not going to continue to be A plus tier for the rest of this season too. Personally, my permaban is Vex. I know that some people thought at first that she wasn't OP, but that's quickly becoming a dream, not reality. This champion will need one more month of people practicing her for you to want to pry your keys from your keyboard in rage. Faker has been wrecking Korean solo queue with her, which will inspire literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to give her a try. You got to understand that guys like Faker have such an influential impact on this game. If Faker plays Vex, everyone will play Vex. Lastly, the most stable pick in the game that you can play right now for climbing, especially given that we have a bunch of assassins right now with dashes, is still Poppy. She's good in both top and jungle, just as she was in Season 11. She has high damage, amazing CC, and very good tankiness. She's everything that you need to win skirmishes and climb. Alright, now that we've covered those obvious choices like Cassidy and Victor, as well as stuff that was already good in Season 11 and still is now, Let's get to some new stuff. Let's talk about First Strike. This is a new keystone this year, and it's probably one of the most volatile changes they have ever made. Seriously, the potential for this rune on some champions is totally off the charts. For others, it's completely worthless. I've seen some confusion around First Strike and what makes it good on certain champions over others, so let's clarify exactly how it works just in case you didn't know. This little ball thing will appear next to your champion when First Strike is ready, and upon entering champion combat, you'll have a brief window to deal bonus damage. At first, that bonus damage was 10%, but after its first, and likely not last nerf by the way, it's now down to 9% bonus damage. That bonus is then converted into gold. 100% of that bonus damage that you did is now gained as gold for melee and 70% for ranged. So, for example, if you proc your first strike and deal 1000 damage, you'll gain 90 bonus damage and if you're melee, get 90 gold. If you're ranged, you'll get 63. At first, that doesn't sound like a lot, 
But what you have to understand is that you have a good amount of time to deal damage, meaning that assassins with a couple of items will deal way, way more than just 1000 damage. And there's no punishment for AoE, so an ability that does 500 damage to 3 enemies will count as dealing 1500. In theory, the most insane first strike abuser would be something like a full item AP Malphite, for example, where you press R with first strike and the gold generation and damage would be insane. Obviously, the gold is moot if you're already full build, but you get the idea. In addition, it's not just the damage done after entering combat, because the spell or attack that puts you in combat will count towards your first strike, which is why it's very good on poke champions like Jace. Finally, enemies can break your first strike. Let's say you're a melee champion with low mobility such as Udyr. All the enemy would have to do is auto you one time or hit you with one spell, and you'd barely ever be able to get off your first strike. So who is it good for? Poke? Burst? Stealth champions who always get to start the engagement so enemies can't break it? Turns out, all three. Right now, there are five key assassins with first strike. If you play these, try first strike, and you'll have some fun as well as some success. Kiana, Zed, Kha'Zix, Kane, and Talon. Kiana might have the highest potential with this keystone given her massive AoE teamfight ultimate, but the thing about Kane, Talon, and Kha'Zix is that they almost never have theirs popped by the enemy. Kha'Zix has insanely high burst that typically starts with him being stealthed, meaning that there's no real way to deal with him generating over 1000 gold per game with this keystone. Kane also has a special interaction with the keystone as the damage will count towards his passive orbs, meaning that first strike Kane will indeed get his form faster than a conqueror one. This has been known with Kane for quite a while that runes like Electrocute and Dark Harvest do give you bonus orbs, but the fastest way to get your form in the game will come from using First Strike. For Zed, he's just all around a great assassin at the moment, sporting the highest ban rate in the game. First Strike on him is just brutal because gold generation matters a lot. Zed is one of the few assassins in the game that you can comfortably say does scale, especially into the right team composition for yours as well as the enemy. These aren't the only champions that can use First Strike by the way, I've experimented with a few off meta picks with the keystone as well as some other stuff, however these are the main assassins that have been in the meta. We can come back to First strike a little bit later. Moving down to the support role, I know I mentioned the top tier enchanters earlier, but let's talk about one that hasn't been for a while named Janna. The last season for Janna was not great. Years and years of nerfs, as well as being in a meta dominated by hard engage, it meant that it was hard for her to have a place. However, she might be back in action a little bit because of Augment. The new Glacial is very easy to proc on Janna with your Q, and it's the ultimate peeling as well as engage tool if you're able to land a long range NATO. Another good way to proc it is to point and click the enemy with your own slow on your W, and then of course land your Q after that. If you're not able to land your Q, your ult will also proc it, knocking enemies away and reducing the damage those pesky assassins do to your team. Something that's very important to know is that Janna is receiving another mini rework to start the year. Do you remember how back in the Ardent meta, Janna was just a shield bot, and realistically you could be a useful champion if all you ever did was stand there and press E? Well, she was given a successful mini rework at the time, putting a lot more power into her laning with her W, and she's been a lane bully ever since then with a neutered version of her shield. I guess Riot didn't like the direction for Janna though, because it's kind of all that she offered. Her biggest strength is maxing W and landing poke in lane, but her defensive tools are a fraction of what they used to be in earlier seasons. Riot has stated that this update is intended to bring down some of the power on her W and in lane and instead make her utility better and change her Q to be a better offensive aggressive tool. It's great to fantasize about hitting these very long range amazing Qs on Janna, but it's not realistic or consistent. It's too hard to land and is nowhere near as good as like a blitz or thresh hook to start and engage. The direction that they're going for here is to try to have Janna be able to start fights on her own rather than just most of the time disengage them. I think in theory this sounds okay, but one thing I'm worried about is that it's not going to be as fun. Janna for me as a non-support or enchanter player is by far the most fun after the original mini rework she got. Walking up in lane, playing aggressively, getting good poke is so enjoyable, but with them sort of gutting that part of her kit, my suspicion is that she's just going to be kind of lame. I hope that I'm wrong here because I enjoy playing Janna, she's genuinely the most fun support for me to play at the moment. 
Turbo Chem Tank received some changes and so far is again viable after getting gutted last season when Udyr abused it even in pro play. Ramus with the new Turbo Chem Tank is sleeper OP. Trust me when I say you're probably going to be banning this later on in the season. It helps his damage a lot, his ganks are undodgeable, and everybody is spamming AD assassins. Ramus can even be set behind a bit, and it doesn't always matter because eventually he will become a problem. It's also possible that the Udyrs and Skarners of last season that were able to use this item could come back, but I don't have any games of them to base that off of because, well, who plays Udyr and Skarner? The three or four times someone has picked Ramus though so far, every single one of them did well by the end of the game. Sometimes they were set so far behind I thought it would be impossible to come back, but after the chem tank, the ganks are just unbeatable. Zinzao has been a good jungler for a while. Last year, they gave him some very strong buffs as well as some quality of life changes that brought up a dead champion from never played to competitively viable. Seriously, this might surprise those of you that don't watch pro play. Did you know that Zinzao had a 70% presence at this last Worlds? The Gore Drinker Conqueror build at the time being busted obviously helped out his case, but here's something that I've noticed recently. Every time that I've seen Zinzaos go Eclipse into Essence Reaver, they have done quite well. I know this is a heavy damage build that might leave you pretty squishy, so you think you could just one-shot him, right? But then he heals, knocks you up, your teammates can't hit him in his ult, and then all of a sudden he's one-shotting you with his Eclipse. Should you listen to me though? Well, as a rule, probably not. And also considering the fact that literally every single pro player still goes Gore Drinker Sterex, it's entirely possible that what I've seen is just circumstantial and it's a small sample size, but I have seen them completely carry games just by themselves with the Eclipse build. So maybe try it out in a norm first. As a league player, do you ever just start randomly theory crafting ideas about the game in the shower or while eating breakfast? I most certainly do, and one thing that popped into my head was AP Poke Kaisa with First Strike. I'm not going to tell you that this is good, because it probably isn't, but dude, it works though, kind of. The potential in this pick is insane. If you get ahead, it's not even funny how little the enemy can do about it. You are constantly chunking them from three screens away and generating gold because of your first strike. Now again, I'm not saying that Showmaker is all of a sudden going to start playing this now or something, but do me a solid and just give it a try. A very important note is that these games you're looking at in this match history, I played them before Kaisa got buffed because on 1124B, they buffed AP Kaisa. Yep, that's right. So if I was able to have a ranked game like this and norms that went like this even before the buffs, it's possible that AP Kaisa isn't completely trolling. Most of the Twitch players that I've seen have been able to pop off using a build that I do believe is now getting more popular with Kraken Slayer into Titanic Hydra. AP Twitch isn't dead by any means, it's still a great build, but Lethal Tempo has quite a bit of potential here. Titanic's Wave Clear is very good, but you might ask yourself, why Titanic over Ravenous? Well, the cone effect, as opposed to the circle from Ravenous, is a little bit better in teamfights when Twitch is hitting the front line in a proper front to back. Also, the massive amount of flat health makes him quite a bit tankier and harder to kill, and you don't really value the haste on Ravenous, and Omnivamp is kind of a terrible stat. A build that seems to have made a meteoric rise is Hybrid Corky. It looks extremely troll. Here's the full setup. The idea is that with Ultimate Hunter, Ravenous Hydra, Ludens, and a Void Staff, your rockets get the absolute maximum value to farm your first strike. The big one with this build just wrecks the entire enemy team. If you want something a bit more in depth, Midbeast has a review of this build. He was adamant in the video about its power level, saying it absolutely has to be nerfed. The funny thing is that in the review, he kept going on and on about how unbeatable it was, and then the guy who was super fed on Corky actually did lose. No flame or anything, that doesn't mean that he was wrong by the way, because just looking at the gameplay, the build is very good, it's easy to see that. A good example of it working in EU West High Elo was a game that No Way played, finishing with 16 kills. 
Interestingly, in this game he did not opt for the ultimate hunter setup as he went for sorcery secondary. Either way, this build isn't going anywhere because it's already being tested extensively by pros, and Corky himself is not a rare pick at the pro level. Without a doubt, even if Corky isn't building these exact items, and maybe they don't care about Ludens instead of something like Crown or Leandris for whatever reason, because first strike Corky is so good, he will likely be played in pro play this year regardless. For all of you Viego enthusiasts out there, crit is the way to go. I think except in circumstances where the enemy is entirely tanky, where Sunderer has a lot of value, crit is just so darn good. I am not a Viego player. Actually, I am brand new to him. I had not played a single game of Viego until the preseason. I didn't even own the champion, I never bought him out of the shop. And currently, I'm sitting at a 100% win rate, although with a small sample size. I didn't think that press the attack would be his best keystone, but when I saw some challenger Viegos taking it, I tried it out myself, and I think it's pretty dang good. The early game ganks are way stronger with PTA instead of the conqueror damage, shield bow into essence reaver, collector, infinity edge, and a situational last item, and you will be one tapping people. This champ is totally crazy, apparently you don't even need any practice on him to start winning some games. Akshan was supposed to be a mid laner, but over the last couple of months, more and more players have been playing him in his new best role. Light, camera, top lane. I'm sure you've seen some clips of guys like Lorlo playing him top, but he's far from being the only one who's jumped on the top Sean hype train. He is everything that's strong about range tops and more. He can kite melee champions like nobody else can with his passive as well as Q movement speed. He shreds tanks with Kraken Slayer, and his E is stronger in this lane because it's a little bit easier to escape and utilize the walls. Every patch, his win rate and pick rate goes up just a little bit, but because he has no CC or tankiness of any kind, you would think that it sort of messes up your team comp, and that might be considered his only downside, but then you can just revive your teammates anyway, so who cares, I guess, go off. Alright, I have a secret OP pick for you. Okay, that's a total lie, because it's not secret at all. People have played Rumble mid for years now. Heck, it was even played in pro play. There have been challenger Rumble mid players for years. Cat's out of the bag, dude, but... Okay, anyway, Rumble mid, very strong again. Probably the strongest he's ever been at. And I know that's a big claim, but check this out. Shadowflame, Doran's Ring. Shadow Flame is obvious why that's good on Rumble, but Doran's Ring, the changes that this received is something that we have to talk about. D-Ring now benefits aggression and heavy trading, as manaless champions, which Rumble is, will now gain some health back. This starting item gives you that little bit of sustain he needed to be completely busted. I only laned against this one time, and it was so impossible to beat that I can tell you right away that Rumble mid is a very, very strong pick, and I expect to see more of this. The changes to Demonic Embrace have done a lot of good for bruiser mages like Cho'Gath and Swain. It's made them even stronger, but one champion who should be building this all the time now is Zac. I think that if you get ahead on Zac jungle, there's not too much you can do about him, and you can't really stop him. He does too much damage, has too much CC, and is too tanky. He can kind of scrap and stand in a 1v5, maybe kill 1-2 to two people, and still live. I've seen some Zac players during this preseason win the game all by themselves, so don't sleep on Demonic Zac. Alright, those were all of the champions that I'm pretty sure about, and I think I know exactly where their place is in this game, and I think that you should try. Now let's get into some that I'm not so sure about and I'm still evaluating. I have had some success with First Strike Diana and using the new Shadow Flame item, but because she's not the best user of Crown, a lot of the squishy mages that you used to be able to one-shot are now unkillable. Something like the Victor matchup last year was pretty easy, but now it's a bit harder. In theory, she should be one of the best First Strike users in the game. If you're able to get an insane combo, you could do 400 bonus damage and generate 400 gold just like that in the blink of an eye. But instead, sometimes, because the top lane tanks are coming back, there's crown mid laners, and every ADC has shield bow, it's really tough to get off your one shots. I really want to tell you that at the moment, Jin is overpowered, but it's not exactly like that, it's more complicated, and something feels wrong by saying that. Jin is nothing if not the master of consistency at the moment. With fleet footwork in the boots 4 pot start, it's pretty difficult to push him out of lane. Every time that I play against him, he's just full HP the whole laning phase and I run out of potions. 
Obviously, he still has tons of flaws, and his pick rate is also in part because he's just fun as heck to play. I don't think that he should be nerfed like Vayne was, but keep your eye on him. Nearly a 30% pick rate, and still trucking along at around a 51% win rate? Those are good numbers. I don't know how strong Caitlyn is. Historically similar to Viego for me, I never played her either. Actually, I used to say that Caitlyn was my worst champion in the entire game. For years, my Caitlyn has been pathetic, and that's sugarcoating it. However, I've put a lot of time into her, probably because of Arcane and the ASU that she received, and I've been using Lethal Tempo most games. What's funny is that I haven't lost a game yet in the preseason. Now, does this mean that she's good? Well, here's what's interesting, her win rate sucks, but they did just add back in some of her headshot mechanics that she lost in that ASU, but this is one that I'll have to leave up to you guys. I want you to let me know and for you to take the reins. Do you think Caitlyn is good despite her bad win rate? And if so, if that's the case, why would hers be bad with a high pick rate, but not Jin's or Vayne's? Is Ezreal with first strike just kleptomancy all over again? Eh, maybe? He isn't really built for burst unless you're talking AP Ezreal. What's interesting is that I saw so much success with him last year and to start the preseason, and then all of a sudden I just started losing all my games. I would go from smurfing in Diamond 2 to Diamond 1 MMR games, and then losing in D4. Maybe that's just variance, or maybe I was using the wrong build, maybe I was having a bad day, but two new pieces of Ezreal technology have now popped up. For Mythics, a lot of the pros are trying Crown. You talk about unkillable because of his mobility, how about throwing a crown on him? You hit him with CC, and then with crown, he still doesn't die anyway. He can just E out after the damage reduction. And since your mythic isn't Sunderer or Triforce, which of course are two Sheen items, that means that you can build Essence Reaver. The second new Ezreal technology is actually a role swap, as pro player for Rogue named Larson has been trying some lethal tempo Ezreal mid. He's had some pop-off games with it, so don't be surprised if this is tested a little bit more as well. I didn't list Evelyn as one of the core first strike assassins, but she has the potential to be completely broken with it. The most gold that I've ever seen a player generate from first strike was by an Evelyn player who did 4k damage and earned 4200 gold in about a 40 minute game. She is in theory one of the best champions in the game to use it because 99% of the time you won't have it broken since you stealth in, charm them or proc it with your rocket belt and then one shot them. Some potential issues for Eve, and maybe why her win rate isn't very good, is because there's tankier mid laners now with Crown, as well as the S12 meta being so far a tanky 5-man ARAM deathball style, which she doesn't do that well into. Obviously, she loves the chaos of solo queue, but the lack of vision control doesn't really matter anyway, since you're already stealthed, and you can't one-shot anyone if they all just group up on each other. Anyway, that's all I've got for you guys today. One thing I would appreciate a lot more than ever is, before you leave, if you could tell me in the comments what you thought of this video. This channel is obviously typically based on the history of the game, but since this has nothing to do with the history, or the nostalgia, or anything like that, if you enjoyed this, let me know. If not, that's okay too. Feel free to leave some constructive criticism. If this video does well, it might give me the green light to try some new content, and hopefully if you guys enjoy stuff that isn't just a League documentary, I could do that too. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time, and I hope you have a happy holiday season.